Hey, welcome to the Real Estate Crowdfunding Show, syndication in the digital age at GowerCrowd.com for another special Life in the Day of C19 podcast. Adam Gower here. And today's guest is Darren Powderly, who is co-founder of CrowdStreet. CrowdStreet, as you know, are one of the biggest real estate crowdfunding platforms on the web. They recently announced that they crossed the billion dollars of equity raised hurdle, an extraordinary accomplishment. And last week, they had a webcast that addressed the impact on commercial real estate of the current coronavirus crisis. So I contacted my old friend Brent Higgelke over there, who's their CMO, and he very kindly hooked me up with Darren to do today's podcast. So what we've put together is a couple of things for you. First of all, on the Gower Crowd website, there is an article that is a detailed summary of everything that was discussed in the webcast. You can find that by navigating to raise money online and then hitting the advanced tab on the website. I'll also put the, a link to that article on the show notes page for today's podcast. The other thing that you'll find on that page is a link to some training that I've put together for you. Uh, specifically as you are there working at home, right? Not voluntarily, but stuck at home, remote working because of all these shenanigans that are going on. So I put together a very detailed description of how I've built my own TV quality home office. And there is also a list of all the equipment that you'll need for that. It's all there on the podcast page for today's episode at gowercrowd.com. Just look for the black box that says a guide for remote workers, how to set up a TV studio quality home office, right? Now, the reason I wanted you to hear from Darren Powderly at Crowd Street today was because of all people in the industry, Darren is probably one of those who has the broadest view of the largest number of sponsors and investors of anybody in the country. And so he can offer a unique perspective of exactly what's going on in the commercial real estate industry. So let's just get straight into it. My guest today, Darren Powderly, co-founder at CrowdStreet. Darren Powderly, co-founder of CrowdStreet. It is an enormous pleasure and honor to talk to you today. It's too bad that the circumstances are what they are. But as an aggregator, probably the biggest aggregator of intelligence in the commercial real estate world right now, mm -hmm. I would like to ask you one key question to start off with. And that is, how are communications in the industry changing during this crisis period or this period of crisis. Let's start with how CrowdStreet is changing its communication patterns. That's a key question. I mean, uh, the common knowledge is to over communicate during times of distress or crises such as we're experiencing today with COVID-19. Uh, CrowdStreet was fortunate to have some contingency plans in place prior to this, this current crisis. We, had no idea, we did not have an epidemic plan in place, but we did have an, you know, a contingency plan in place. We're also, uh, you know, we're a high tech company. We have a distributed workforce throughout the United States. And we have, you know, a bunch of great tools. We, we use Slack and we use all the Google Docs. And, you know, most of us have laptops and we work all the time. And so we work wherever we are. Uh, but we, we do have 110 people, most of which are based in Portland, Oregon. Uh, and so we started to roll out our contingency plan in, within the team itself. And so I'm, I'm addressing your questions first, starting with CrowdStreet Inc. And, and taking care of our people. And of course, that all of our customers, our owners, commercial estate owners, we call them sponsors. And then all of our individual investors, we have 90,000 individual investors. You know, I'm going to get to them in a second and I'm going to get to the industry uh, as a whole. But like, you know, what I think was is really critical and what we've been very encouraged with is that a number of customers and uh own commercial real estate owners uh, had similar contingency plans, right? And so we kind of phased ours in where he said, hey, optionally you can work at home and here's the criteria, right? And here's the work from home best practices. We want you to be 
feel comfortable. We want you to feel healthy in a safe environment. And then we, the next week was, we're going to recommend that everyone work from home. Uh, and then a week after that, it was nobody's, the office is closed and nobody's coming in. And we did, you know, the deep cleaning of the office and so forth. Nobody's allowed in the office today. And what we're seeing that roll out with all occupiers, commercial real estate occupiers across the United States right now, is that they're doing similar things. And landlords, um, we're coaching our landlords, we're expressing best practices across a wide variety of, of elements in the, in the real estate business right now. But one of the things is that you're, we're all in this together. Right. If there's a silver lining of COVID-19, Adam, it is that we are all in this together. There's no villains here, right? I mean, we're all just trying to deal. So landlords, take care of your occupants, take care of your tenants, take care of your employees. And so we're trying to do our best as, as teachers, as, as a really good resource, you know, because listen, we're not selling anything right now. We're just here to service our community of real estate owner operators and, and individual investors and any other participants that we're in. And we're doing a ton of communication. So yeah, it could be everything from, you know, like simple things like make sure, you know, like use hand sanitizer, but of course that's like a no brainer, right? But, but there are other more complicated things like, you know, currently processing the stimulus package announced two days ago, tomorrow apparently being signed in a $2 trillion complex, biggest hit, hit, you know, in the history of the United States. Who's interpreting that? Well, we are. We're helping interpret these complex, you know, uh, developments, right, that are critical um, to our, our, our individual investors, to our landlords, and, and helping them communicate to their occupants as well. So let me ask you, how are sponsors responding to this crisis? What are you seeing kind of across the gamut? In terms of communication, and when you think about this, this uh, T2, whatever, two trillion, two mm. trillion dollar stimulus. My yeah. first question is, how do you access that, right? And I imagine mm -hmm. there's lots of people are wondering the same thing. So tell me something about what you're seeing sponsors are doing in terms of the way they're communicating differently. Yeah, well, um, so, so they're trying to, you know, every occupier is in a different situation, right? Uh, clearly retail and hospitality just getting clobbered right now, just absolutely clobbered. So you're going to, you're going to deal with your retail tenants in a very different way than you're going to deal with say an industrial tenant that uh, might actually be experiencing an uptick in their business because they're the last mile to home delivery. And, and that's in demand right now as people are in self quarantine situation. Um, so, so I think that it really depends on, on who your audience is. If you're a landlord and trying to determine, is my occupier, is my tenant going to be able to pay rent, right? How should I deal with them? Uh, it's still a, obviously for-profit business. Uh, if you're a landlord, you're, you're in this business to, you know, make profits, but it's also in this humanitarian crisis you know, they are, you know, going above and beyond probably like I've never seen before, but they're definitely all, you know, asking questions. And, you know, today's questions are like, okay, have we studied the stimulus package, right? Three days ago, the question was, is the stimulus passage, package going to be get, going to be passed? Well, here we are. Well, we got it, right? And there's a ton of information to dissect, right? There's the, the thankfully, the package is going to include a lot of relief for the real estate industry, Right, whether that be rental relief, or I've heard actually on a state basis, I've heard um, uh, no more evicting uh, tenants during this time. You can the landlord cannot evict their tenant, right? So thankfully, there's some rent relief in there, and there's payments directly to individual investors, right? And then there's mortgage relief as well, either pushing out the mortgage payments that a landlord needs to make. Obviously, they're not getting rent. How are they going to make their mortgage payments, right? And so there's and, and you're seeing this not only from little mom and pop tenants. I just saw the other day that Subway the most popular sandwich shop in the United States has came out uh, unapologetically and said, we're not going to be paying rent in full uh, on all of our stores. And, you know, so it's, it's with the most stable tenants all the way down to normal people, you know, everyday people. Now, as, as you are reining in your sales uh, efforts in mm -hmm. order to shift to more of a servicing and support uh, orientation, right to right. help the community absolutely that you have in what way are you seeing sponsors doing the same thing are they still trying to raise capital or are they adjusting by 
how are they changing things up as far as yeah. their investors are concerned as well? Yeah, so this happens so quickly. Obviously, a record 30-day plunge in the stock market. Everyone just just being sort of dumbfounded about you know how fast this all took place. So what we have heard from uh, our participation in the market, and we've been just like doubling down on communication ourselves, seeking to understand what the activities are, whether it be from tenants or owners or lenders, right? What's going on in the debt markets? Um, what we've heard a couple of themes is that the deals that were in process are still, you know, trans, you know, heading toward getting closed, right? So lenders aren't saying, well, you know, I was gonna do that loan for you, Mr. Buyer of real estate, but now that COVID hit, I'm pulling out. Uh, we've seen less of that. We've seen some of that. Uh, Wall Street Journal just announced a very large deal in Manhattan that fell apart. It was an $800 million deal and Deutsche Bank pulled out, right? Um, so it's not that it's, it's completely absent in the market, but for the most part in the middle market, we're seeing deals that are continuing to close. Um, I did just hear about another deal today that uh, it was more so that the buyer had less confidence closing because of the COVID impact to leasing and so forth. And so they went to the seller and said, we need more time. We need 90 more days. And so that's another theme. Deals that um, are, are still alive, but haven't like at the finish line of closing. Now everything's being delayed. 30, 60, 90 days. Give me more time to interpret what is happening here. And of course, sellers have that option to say, well, there's no other buyers at all. Like, so there's not, there's not a new buyer. So I'll give you the extra 90 days, Mr. Buyer. Um, and they've, we've seen a little bit of price negotiations, I think across the United States right now. Um, I think I anticipated to, to increase more in terms of buyers, you know, uh, retrading or buyers, you know, coming in at lower prices than what the seller was asking for. So the bid ask spread is going to continue to increase. I, I think as this, as this, you know, downturn, you know, continues to last, um, but, but delaying uh, rather than killing is, is a, is a theme. Uh, deals and then also price negotiations probably in that five to ten percent range right now but we we really still obviously don't know how the stimulus package is going to help landlords and occupiers of real estate and that's going to become evident in in 60 90 120 days so there are a lot of questions right i mean that's really what we're facing right now a lot of a lot of questions yeah. that are unanswered yeah so there's a couple things that you say i'm going to ask you i'm going to ask you one now yeah. uh but uh, the, the kind of dovetails you know i'm fascinated by this idea of communication look suddenly um, the our both of our businesses are online businesses right now suddenly yeah. the whole world is being forced to communicate online and yes. one of the things that you said i'm going to quote it back at you because it's something i've been telling my clients a lot recently and i've learned from my own experiences doubling down on communication you do right. not want to go quiet right now okay so and i've noticed that in your communication and i get i'm on your email list obviously yes. i know i've noticed a dramatic shift into advising sponsors on how to communicate i think it's absolutely amazing tell me something about that what are your best practices what are you seeing out there best practices that sponsors are employing for that doubling down of communication. Well, thanks, because that's a nice compliment to us right now. I mean, we really do consider ourselves like, like uh, a trusted advisor to the industry. Uh, we certainly serve individual investors and, and we wanna be a source of knowledge for individual investors in good times and in bad. Uh, so, you know, and we're, we're not, we don't sell, we don't have a culture of selling at CrowdStreet. We have a culture of education, transparency, uh, in terms of our marketplace, making offerings available for individual investors to um, you know, get access to. Uh, they can do their own research, right? It's a very heavy do-it-yourself experience for individual investors. Uh, and, and hence, that's the direct-to-consumer online channel overall. Those are, those are themes that CrowdStreet has, but those are, that's the beauty of the internet, right? And so, you know, COVID is definitely going to push us all forward uh, in quite a rapid manner, probably more so than, than we would have uh, comfortably done. It would have happened maybe 10 years from now, man, right? maybe now it happens in two years because we're all forced into this experiment of, of working from home and, 
and doing more online, right? My kids are both in, uh, you know, I working or school from home. I think that's wonderful. I think college education is like ridiculously expensive anyway, but anyway, I don't want to go off. <laughs> the whole different line. Exactly. Di di yeah. Different, uh, different. So, so tell me how, tell me how sponsors are changing their communication patterns. Are they, yeah. are they talking about the problem? I mean, look, we, I actually have a, th a three phased, uh, a three phased email or, or an email that is structured in, th in three sections that we are, formulating for all of our clients that we're sending out. I'm interested to know what you're seeing and what you think based on your, you know, aggregation of all these sponsors, what you think is being done well. We, we have hundreds of uh, what we call institutional quality, commercial real estate owners, operators, developers, right? And th these are larger firms. These are, you know, some of the best firms in any given city across the United States. We sent out a best practices email. We said, in addition to giving the, you know, Everyone wants to know, it was everyone health and everyone safety. Okay, get that out of the way, right? It's number one. It's the reason why we're doing this lockdown, right? Is, is for the, the, the good, you know, the moral choice that we've made to lock down and, and, and suffer this, this sort of economic impact. And then get down to business, right? What were your business continuity plans? What are you doing right now to implement the business continuity plans at the operating company level? right? As well as at, as at the property entity level. Those are two different businesses, right? There's the mothership business, which is the sponsor company. And then they have entity levels for each property that they own. Tell, you know, what are you doing in there? Distributions, right? Are the distributions going to be suspended or temporarily paused, right? We assume that they are in almost every case. It doesn't matter if you own a hotel that's 5% occupied today, um, or you own an industrial building, you know, that's leased to Amazon. Probably the Amazon lease building doesn't suspend distributions because it's on a long-term, you know, lease. And that thing just keeps going up 3% annually every year. And it's never even going to record this massive V-shaped, you know, hopefully it's a V-shaped, you know, recession that we're in. So talk about distributions, right? Investors want to know. Uh, investors want to know like, okay, Clearly, your business plan is going to be impacted. What's the new plan? How has the business plan on the property changed, right? And also, you know, uh, tell us about what is going to happen with the cash burn at the property level entity. Does this mean that I'm going to have to be part of a capital call, right? This in real estate, private real estate, you know, when the reserves run low, who funds the gap? The investors do. They get a capital call. Well, investors don't like surprise capital calls. They don't like capital calls at all. They hate surprise capital calls. So we're coaching the sponsors to say, if in fact you're, run, you're running a higher cash burn, which you most likely are in today's environment, you know, what is this sort of, you know, capital call, you know, scenario when it's going to happen? Do not surprise investors. They need to prepare for it, right? And then, and then there's a, a number of other things. Like right now we're in tax season and the tax, you know, filing was delayed, but uh, it had it not been delayed and the delay itself is, is a form of communication. We have to all get on the same page, especially with our investors, but the sponsors now have more time. They're going to have more time to issue the K-1s. How are they going to communicate the K-1s? Another benefit of having an online platform and, and sort of a workflow that is all digital is that we can issue those K-1s, you know, in the same format that we had before and monitor exactly which sponsor has or has not updated their K-1, just as, as an example, since it is typically tax season this year, it's a little early, I guess. Uh, yeah, the tax deadline, I never really understood that because I always do mine on October the 13th. So it's never really been an issue for me in April. Uh, but uh, so you've talked about a few investor questions. Now, very interesting questions, right? These are very important questions that people are asking. Are there any other big questions that you think it, as sponsors should be addressing in their communications for investors? Again, based on what you're hearing and aggregating from the investor side. Yes, um, you know, I think that sponsors are, uh, most of the sponsors we speak to when I ask them, okay, what is your plan for the rest of the year, right? They're the deals that we've done and this is our primary focus right now because uh, we have switched from a, a new sales and growth sort of, you know, primary uh, focus. Our, 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 our primary focus today is more of like servicing and helping communicate, right? We are, we are 
partnering with our, our real estate companies, the owners, we are partnering with our investors to get every, everyone the information that they need, even though it's extremely fluid. Um, once we take that, now the secondary focus is growth. So what has happened to your pipeline plans, right? Most customer, most sponsors or owners are saying, I'm not sure yet. I'm pausing everything that wasn't already in process. I'm hoping to close those deals out, but we're not doing brand new deals. Most of them are saying they're not doing brand new deals today, right? We hope, and I think for the economy's sake overall, that transactions pick back up in the not too distant future, right? If you don't have any houses selling in America, uh, if you have no commercial buildings transacting in America, you have a big unemployment problem, right? Um, and, and you have a big, you know, construction problem. And you have, a lot of people are employed in, in the real estate business, as, as we all know. Um, but, you know, there is truth to the fact that they're not, you know, doing new deals. We asked them about how their investment thesis has been impacted. You know, when things do pick back up, they do acknowledge that they'll be looking for more sort of, you know, stable income properties. For example, it's, it's not easy right now to project, you know, if what a value add strategy looks like, right? Um, so instead of buying an apartment building that's 60% uh, leased and they're going to spend $1,000 per unit because they think you can get some higher rent uh, six months from now when they complete the, the renovations on the, on the apartment building, that is a crystal ball that nobody has in this environment. In a good stable environment, it's a difficult business model. And it's what we've done very well as a platform and our, and our sponsors have done very well. It's what we're known for. But they're shifting now to go try to find 97% leased apartment buildings because not many people are moving right now. It's another impact of, of today's trend. So you want to look for stabilized income properties. All right. So now it's interesting you say that. So, you know, it might be a little premature to start talking about this, but I'm going to anyway, ahead, because man. I've definitely had some emails coming into my inbox that talk in precisely these terms. And I'm going to contextualize it for you yeah. uh, with some optimism, right? It's okay to be optimistic I'm, even in the darkest of times. So you surprise me that sponsors are saying we're looking for the stable kind of class A 99%, you know, whatever in the middle of somewhere with a million people and et cetera, et cetera, because in my experience of downturns, actually what happens, and this is where I think we have cause for optimism, and again, I'm gonna contextualize this for you, is actually what happens is right. that they start to find opportunistic investments, right? What has not yet been termed distressed real estate. Nobody's used that term yet, although there are plenty who are talking about opportunistic acquisitions. And so the tide I propose to you will turn when mm -hmm. greed once again overcomes fear. Right. And people start to say now is a buy opportunity. And that's when things start to shoot up. And we know that we've then gone past the worst. If that's what everybody starts talking about. Have you heard or seen any of that yet? Adam, I'm, I'm 44 years old, and this is my third nasty downturn, right? First, it was the dot-com crisis young in my career, September 11th, uh, following on the heels of that or in the middle of that. Then it was the Great Recession, and, and now it's this. Uh, clearly, this is such an early, you know, sensitive topic in terms of, you know, the health crisis and so forth and the humanitarian crisis, I think. Uh, I'm very proud of our nation for the collaborative efforts there and, you know, to look out for our vulnerable population. It's the right thing to do, as painful as in, in each other's wallets, but and as a collective economy. That said, um, let's shift to what's going to happen, right? Because it, it's hard to, to talk about being greedy and opportunistic on distressed today, but you're absolutely right. That is part of every downturn, you know, it flushes out a whole bunch of people and, and businesses really, you know, more, let's, let's keep it more at the entity level. It flushes out businesses and 
and it causes a great deal of opportunity for the businesses that were well prepared going into it. I will say that every six months since we started the business in 2014, we started in 2012, we launched it in 2014, because we were born out of the Great Recession, I would say the ashes of the Great Recession, right? Uh, we were sort of born out of that and built out of that. It's part of our DNA. Uh, we never lost it. And so we do have a recession business plan. We know exactly, you know, what we're going to do. Not to say it won't change because it will, right? Because, you, you know, you have the best plan and then things change, right? We didn't, we, we didn't build a business plan for an epidemic or a pandemic. We built it for something that looked like a normal recession. Uh, and so we'll be implementing that ourselves, right? Will we see, you know, will we be looking out for, are we already talking about where the opportunities will be? Absolutely. Right. You I mean any business person would be foolish not to. So will it be bankruptcies in, in retail and hotels? Definitely unavoidable at this point, even with the two trillion dollar stimulus from the government. There will be some weaker players unprepared, that, you know, as this market you know, started to fall. Will office trends, you know, flush out a bunch of you know, operators that own office buildings that, you know, I mean, we work is not looking good right now. Neither are any of the other, you know, um, uh, shared office facilities, but like, you know, you look at like a WeWork that has about two or 3% of the, the total office market in Manhattan. It is, it is not good. If you you know, it's funny you say that actually, because that's yeah. actually one asset class. It, maybe that particular business uh, entity isn't healthy, but they've had their hard time, you know, before all of this happened. Yeah. It seems to me though, and I don't want to go too much down that rabbit hole, but now that everybody is learning to work from home, yeah. that the remote operation uh, or the or remote working will become more commonplace. And yet you don't want to be sitting in your living room or in, me in my study, right, with a big green screen behind me. I want to be around people. And yet I still want to work remotely. And so to go to a co-working space down the road that's really comfortable working with other people, not necessarily in my company, yeah. To me, it seems like something that could actually be a growth industry after this. Any thoughts about that? Anything you've seen in that regard? Or is it still too early? Or even just your thoughts. I mean, you're in this remote working business now, you know, online. That's your essence, right? Darren, you've frozen. <laughs> I'm not even sure if you're talking. You kind of got a look on your face but I can edit it. Oh, you're back. All right, good. Oh, I'm back. Yeah, yeah. I was like, you totally froze on me. Okay. Now, how much my question, because I kind of rabbited on with that question. I'll come in and edit this bit out. Did you hear my question? You know, start over because I lost you. Um, I, you just froze at the beginning of the question. Fine. So I'll just repeat it now. I'm going to pause yeah. so I can find the gap and then I'll ask the question. All right. So it's interesting you say that because, look, we, I understand that WeWork has had its problems already, mm -hmm. but this whole complete shift to working out of your house, now everybody's working remotely. It seems to me that we might actually come to like that, right? Not necessarily working out of your house, but not having to commute to an office, but you still want to be around people. So right. one area that seems like it might be a growth industry is co-working where you can go somewhere super close work with people who aren't actually in your company is that i mean just a personal opinion is that something actually, what do you think i mentioned the co-working because i think that they're you know that one you know we work is probably in, in some trouble right now unless they totally restructure everything uh but i actually like i love the experience of we work uh, I've been in many of them all around the United States and I love the experience. I, I personally work out of a, uh, a co-working facility and so I'm flexible. Um, I work from my home some days, but most often I'll go in for, to a co-working facility. You know, Portland is, it, our office in Portland is like a traditional office space, but we're growing so rapidly. We have needs, you know, for, for you know, flex space and so forth. I think it's, it's absolutely a, a, a trend that's here to stay. Um, but I do think that the credit worthiness of some of the biggest players out there are going to be impacting banks' uh, abilities to loan. And you'll start to see some cap rate, cap rate impact or valuation impact for, for buildings that are sort of primarily, you know, or, or majority 
co-working tenants in that building. So yeah, it's just going to be, it's just going to be an interesting change. I, I think also, you know, it'll, it'll be interesting to see, you know, real estate leases are still somewhat un inflexible. They don't really react well to the market, you know, uh, so they don't expand and contract as much, you know, you're locked into five and 10 year leases still. And that was one of the, we work biggest benefit, uh, and why, why companies like to we work and, and it totally makes sense actually, because, you know, traditional old school, you know, five, 10 year leases, um, they're almost always being renegotiated in the, in the middle of the term. Like almost everyone is unhappy with their lease. If you're on a 10 year term, unless you're a big fortune 100 company. Right. And, and, you know, we were talking about, uh, the, you know, the, uh, the, 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 flushing out of some entities right, yeah. during this downturn. We were talking yeah. about the possibility of the uptick. So let me ask you this. It seems to me that right now for investors is a tremendous opportunity actually to identify best of class sponsors. Why? Because during an upturn, right, when the market is on a roaring bull market, it's hard to miss right now when the chips are on the table, I don't know how many metaphors I'm going to mix, but you know, when the times are tough, it's a great time to really see how the strong perform. Right. Oh. And a great time to think. So like, like getting back to communication, what, what are, how are the best sponsors showing their metal right now? Right. Uh, we have a great group, a uh, multifamily group in Chicago, and they had a business continuity, continuity plan in place. It has been extremely smooth. You know, um, they've been over communicating exactly what's happening. And they told people that they had a continuity plan. They're just implementing it now. It is, uh, it is helping people remain calm. They are, you know, setting uh, financial updates on the property. They have, you know, uh, seized distributions, uh, but that's a responsible act. And I think that, you know, we'll, we'll continue to see those. They're a really strong sponsor. And you're totally right. Is that like, you know, it's these times that test, you know, who is the truly best in class, you know, real estate, we call them sponsors, but the, the owner operator companies and, and who was, uh, you know, just, just enjoying the ride, right? you know, the good times and, and really do, doesn't have what it takes to survive during a downturn. Uh, as I said, I've been through three of them and my business partner Torstein has also been through three of them. We have a fairly uh, seasoned, let's call it, uh, old might be another word, but uh, a fairly experienced executive team. But, you know, when, the, when we look at sponsors uh, and, and they have to apply, as you probably know, they have to apply and the bar is very, very high and they have to be accepted, right? We, we look at new sponsors coming out of the Crash Partners as like they apply, we look at their application and we offer an acceptance to them. And then we enroll them to our online, you know, fundraising program and they can get kicked out at any time if they misbehave. Right. You know, if they have done one or two deals with us in the past and we're monitoring their updates through our asset performance department and they're just like way they're off, they're off on what they told the investors they would perform with, then then, you know, they get kicked off the marketplace. And we have no so actually talking about that's kind of same theme. You talked about doubling doubling down on communications, right? Yeah. That's what I love to man. I love online communication. So yeah. what, are you th what are you seeing best of class sponsors doing in terms of frequency of communication? How has that changed during a crisis versus pre-crisis? In investors want as many updates as we can give them. I mean, we've got some of our sponsors that are giving, you know, snippet sort of updates rather than one big, you know, three page update with detailed reports and so forth, you know, almost on a weekly basis, like this is what we're, this is what's new. That's, that's a lot. You know I mean, at CrowdStreet, we have moved to uh, weekly board calls with our stakeholders, with our board of directors. We have moved to weekly all hands meetings. So we get 110 people on Zoom. Uh, thank God the internet is real. <laughs> thank God for Zoom. Thank God for Zoom. Thank God the internet is stable and functioning. Uh, yes. Uh, that is, it is just, I couldn't imagine what we would be going through. I could say the bloody power went out here yesterday for 12 hours. I didn't know what to do. I thought, oh, fuck, can I, I figured, you know, I'll go for a walk. I took the dog for a walk. Came yeah. Out. 
I thought, you know what happens if that happens? But anyway, sorry, I've cut you off. So, so that was just sharing a little bit about we're, what we're doing, uh, weekly all hands meetings. And so I think it sponsors at a very minimum monthly. Monthly updates to investors. Is that enough, really? You think monthly? No, I, I think maybe, maybe uh, you know, bi-monthly or twice a month would, would be better. Uh, weekly is a lot because you know, there's, there's maybe not a lot of changes in a week. Uh, but, you know, just every two week increments right now, just in terms of what's going on in the universe, it, it seems like a lifetime. So we're saying no, no less than monthly right now to our sponsors. And some of the sponsors are, are, are doing it twice a month. Right. Now you've got, let me ask you this, because I know you've got some initiatives coming up. Uh, what are, you've got, what was it uh, Brent was telling us about this, this initiative that hopefully you will have uh, started, isn't it? Or not a, a, a um, update call, you calling um, experts in on a regular basis. Tell me something about that, why you're doing it. So we have a lot of friends in the industry. Uh, we're really proud of the community that we've built up. And, and usually when we talk about our, our community, uh, it's, it's the 90,000 individual investors. And what's nice about an individual investor community, Adam, it could be like me and you and uh, each individual person listening to this podcast right now, right? Th that is our main community. If you want to invest in real estate, you can join Crowdstream, join the community. And so we do a ton about that. But we also have, you know, hundreds of, of real estate operating companies and owners. And, and we ask them, and then we have all these lenders and we have brokers. And so we, we've been a hub and spoke, you know, of sorts in, within the industry. And we've been, you know, interviewing is probably the best, most appropriate word. You know, I've got a template of 10 questions I'll ask a sponsor and then, uh, and then different questions ask in investors. And then I speak with my friends who are lenders or mortgage brokers and I get different questions I ask them. And so we're collecting all this, this data and then we're re reproducing it for the benefit of our community, right? We, we're huge believers in education. We're huge believers in, in the sharing and transparency of information. It's, it's one of our you know, core values, basically. Yeah. Um, and and you know, to, to, if, listen, if, if we're not, the cash register at CrowdStreet is a little quieter than it was. <laughs> That's right. understandable. You're not the only one. How do we add value to our community during this time? And that is through knowledge, right? That is through accurate data. Um, and we have, you know, some, some inherent benefits as a technology company with, you know, data analytics and the ability to survey and the ability to collect, you know, truth, um, you know, in the form of data and reproduce it. And then we can opine on that. We can, you know, ask the opinions of our friends in the industry. And everyone is here. It's a very collaborative spirit. And I'm, I actually, again, I'm really... I'm really sort of um, encouraged uh, about, you know, humanity's response uh, all over the world to COVID-19. I'm particularly proud of Americans, you know, response. Uh, I'm proud of the real estate community's response as well, because we're pulling together in a way that we haven't done in a while. And, and we're going to get through this. And, you know, the eternal optimist in me and you, and, you know, it's like, we're already starting to see, I mean, I don't know if I would judge the stock market because by the time you publish this, it could be down. <laughs> exactly, that's right. We have seen the market come up a little bit. I don't judge my happiness. My happiness is not necessarily based on the stock market, but um, other, other, it is a gauge, right? It's a, it's a gauge of what's going on. So apparently if you throw $2 trillion from the government, you know, at an economy, it'll cause, you know, the stocks to it go should, up. It should help a bit. Let yeah. me ask you th three sign-off questions because I know yeah. you're very, very busy. Uh, you've got a lot to do. So I yeah. want to ask you three sign-off questions. The first one, most importantly, um, you do have this incredible information initiative. And while I was talking, yeah. I opened up the CrowdStreet website. Just want to make sure that folk know how to get on your email list. Uh, do we just need to open up a create an account? Is that the button? I'll tell you what. Yeah. 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 You, can, you can just tell me exactly what, where they need to go and I'll put it on my show notes page yeah. for today's uh, podcast. I would right. just go to crowdstreet.com if you're yeah. interested in getting the updates with uh, what we call CrowdStreet views and some of our market research. There's obviously no call. There's absolutely no cost for any of this. Mm -hmm going to get all the information uh, free of charge. If you decide that that information leads you 
uh, or your family to a point where you'd like to invest in real estate, then you can go on the marketplace and browse. And I will say this, that the marketplace is also available. You do have to register to set up a free account. The marketplace is a fantastic way to understand private equity real estate investing and all the key metrics that you know these, these owner operators are putting out there. What, what really savvy or professional investors are, are uh, the, the questions they need answered prior to making an informed investment decision. It's all right there on the page. Um, so I would, uh, we have students of, of, of the profession uh, constantly online. We have people that are, are not comfortable yet, but they're on our site all the time and they're learning a ton and they're, they're contacting us. Uh, then the newsletters and so forth. So you can sign up for our newsletters at crowdstreet.com as well, or just join the community and you'll get a, a regular flow of content that we put out uh, as part of being a part of our investor community. So thanks. Yeah, and, 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 Sean, there's absolutely no better time than being stuck at home for weeks on end to learn something new. So let me ask you two final questions as, yeah. as we wrap up, Darren. Best advice that you could give today for sponsors? And then I'm gonna ask you the same question about investors. What's, what, what, just sitting here today, knowing this is a moving target, what's your advice to sponsors today? Well, sponsors are in a wartime situation. You know, they need to be around the board meeting, uh, even if it's a virtual board room, right? Uh, via Zoom, which, which it is. Uh, no, none of our sponsors are going into the office uh, for responsible you know, purposes, um, but they need to be, you know, every morning, uh, the decision makers at, at the sponsors, and we're usually talking about a partnership or a team, sometimes it's led by a certain family member, but they need to be in the office every single morning, tuned in to, you know, what's going on at the operating level, you know, how are they following through in their contingency plans, what's going on at each property level, what are they, they need to be insert, you know, interpreting the reports that they're getting from their asset and property managers. They need to be leaning on those professionals. Uh, they need to be, you know, getting the best advice possible from those third party, you know, professionals that they decided to hire in the first place. And that's what best in class sponsors do. Obviously they surround themselves with the smartest, best, you know, service professionals in the industry. Now's the time where they earn their dollars, right? Um, this is the time they earn their fees and everyone's fees are going down right now because rents are going down or people aren't paying their rents, but they're around the uh, table, you know, at the boardroom level, they're, they're getting debriefed on everything on a daily basis. They're turning around and, and commute, they're taking action. That's actually before they're communicating back to their investors, then they're taking action all day, every day on whatever they can do, right? Many of them own their own property management team. So they might have hundreds of employees. They got employees at every property or in different cities around the United States. They are taking action at the property level for whatever they can do. They're communicating with their lenders. Uh, over, if they're, that, that's like the key group, right? I mean, you know, uh, if you are getting get some relief from your lenders and maybe the, the stimulus package is gonna provide additional relief, right? That's key, no surprises um, from your lenders. And then of course, after all this action is in place, they're doing the right things for their properties, for themselves and for their investors. And one of the nice things about private real estate is there is an alignment of interest, or at least there should be. The deals you see on CrowdStreet, we talk about that alignment of interest. They have their own skin of the game. They have their own money in the game, and they're also managing third party uh, capital from, from investors, right? Uh, so communicate to their investor community. Exactly, right? Everything, all this advice that you're giving to sponsors, make sure that you try to yeah. communicate what you're doing yeah. to your investors as well in real time. So last question, best advice uh, or what advice to give for investors in these interesting times during which we were? Real estate's a long-term, it's a long-term investment. Um, in the last 30 days, the stock market has dropped 30%. Uh, it's, it's the thing I like about real estate and the reason why real estate is a different investment than publicly traded stocks is that it's a long-term investment. Not to say that real estate is not going to uh, go down in value uh, throughout this downturn, but I think it's uh, during a time of stress, during economic stress and recessions, you have the ability to you know, look at different asset types and different managers uh, and you have the opportunity to either ride, you know, ride it out um, and, and you know, if, if the sponsor doesn't need to sell, the owner doesn't need to sell a particular building, right? Uh, unless 
they have too much debt and unless the the loan you know becomes a default and the loan gets called and that that bank then takes over that property that's where real estate owners and operators get in trouble so use this time as a lesson if you didn't already know this which most of you do that you know think about loan to value think about a stress test on rents right what happens what's the worst case scenario on a property until the bank will will say okay you you you've you've got a you know defaulted on your covenants of your loan and we're going to step in and take this over that's where equity investors get hurt the most uh, talk with sponsors about it in advance so there are some things Adam that I think is just like you know hold on right and 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 you know, just know that we're in this for the long term. Most of the deals are multi-year deals and you don't need to sell at any particular time. Uh, and also, you know, use it as an opportunity to become a better investor. Think about, you know, the next deal you do. Ask all the right questions about how this deal will perform, how a sponsor will perform during yet the next downturn that none of us want to think about here in late March. But there will be another. And <laughs> <clears throat> so leave it on a bright note. Don't worry. When this is over, there'll be another one. <laughs> <laughs> no, in, in all seriousness, I mean, I, 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 uh, I haven't been very nervous. I, I've been nervous for loved ones. I've been nervous for the vulnerable members of our community. I have not been that nervous about um, the economy necessarily over, say, the next two, one, two, three years. I think we're going to come back out of this. Uh, I think the I think the overall sort of you know community is going to do the right thing and support those more heavily impacted. My my friends who own restaurants or my friends who are just unemployed now. You know we're we're I think we should really do the best thing. And I love to see the in the stimulus package that we are to you know helping out Main Street. That that that's a very positive improvement uh, for us. So Adam, I, I think we're we're going to do fine, and I think that real estate you know will. Uh, weather this storm as well. And uh, not to say there won't be distress or, or some opportunities, uh, distressed opportunities uh, out there, but, um, you know, and, and then talk to us. Like if we can help individual investors, you know, uh, determine how is their portfolio going to perform? That's another area of service that we've just shifted into. I mean, we've been doing this for a while. Investors call us and they say, Hey, can you just help me get a you know feel for is do I really have a diversified portfolio? Can you help me have to understand like the deals I've done, like how how they're all performing this per portfolio view? Well, well, now we're going to extend that offering, right? We want to just sit down with our individual investors and, and you know help them figure out what what they have today if they haven't already done it. Some of our savviest investors they do that on their own. Some of the other investors and maybe the majority of our investors like they don't have the skill set or maybe they don't have the time. They want the help. We can help them analyze their portfolios. Uh, and if they want to actually go beyond that, we have we have an additional service uh, through our registered investment advisor. They can set up an account. We can build them a custom portfolio, you know, on a go forward basis. But that that's that's for you know next. Darren, thanks so much and uh, really appreciate your time. I know it's uh, hectic times, interesting times, and um, I really uh, wish you well in Thank both uh, economics and in health during this uh, challenging period. Darren Powderly, co-founder of CrowdStreet, thank you so much for joining me today. Adam, thank you very much. Thanks for all your work and thanks for putting producing the show and all the great content that you put out there. You and I've, I've watched you for years now and uh, you, you do an excellent job. And so the community is, is glad to have you. Thank you. All right. That was Darren Powderly, co-founder of CrowdStreet, providing us with probably the most detailed insights into exactly what's going on with the commercial real estate industry as a result of coronavirus during this crisis, primarily because he sees more sponsors and more investors every single day than any of us likely will see in our entire lives, I would imagine. Anyway, you can find links to the summary article that I put together for you covering CrowdStreet's webcast last week, as well as a link to a replay, actually, of that webcast. And don't forget also that on the podcast page for today's episode, you will find a free guide for remote workers I've put together for you that walks you through exactly how I've set up my own TV quality home studio, right? So, so it's all there on the podcast page at gowercrowd.com. 
All right, that's it for today's special Life in the Day of C19 podcast. Thank you for listening. And thank you, Darren Powderly, co founder at CrowdStreet, for your time with me today. I know it is a very busy and intense time for you. So I really appreciate you spending a few minutes with us here today. That's all for this episode. I'll see you next time. Be well. And for now, this is Dr. Adam Gower signing off. Thank you.